right, you ready? Anybody need sermon notes? Wave at me. Hey, if you're watching us online, we're going to be taking communion today. And so everybody in the house, in the seat in front of you, there is a little communion cup that looks like this. It's in a little holder. You can go ahead and get that out if you want to. And try not to open up the juice, but get the, the, just get ready for the bread because it's hard to open up. They're changing the design. They finally, you know, we used to pass the plate. And COVID came, and nobody wants to touch anybody else's germ. But you know what? We all got the blood of Jesus on us. And we got the mind of Christ. You got to remind yourself, you have the mind of Christ. And so we need to just do what God says. And, but we're going to partake of communion. Go ahead and get that cup and have it ready. We're going to do it at the end. And so we're talking about the importance of communion. If you'll look uh, and follow with your notes. But I want to read. The Apostle Paul was taught by Jesus himself. Uh, the importance of communion, and explained it to him. And it's a little deeper in, in some cases than what we're going to talk about, but I, I want to go, I want to show you some important things about communion today, okay? And uh, so many things have been taught on it, and so many things uh, uh, have even been wrong. And, you know, I, I don't always get things right, but, you know, we're trying, right? And God, God's merciful. You know, if you misinterpret a scripture, you're not going to hell. Come on, till you, you know, but you learn right, you change. It's called repentance. If, if you're going to Bristol, it's that way. But if you end up going that way, you need to turn around. That's called repentance. I'm turning around. Okay, y'all don't, you know, I asked my wife which way was north, south, east, and west one time. She goes, I don't know, but the mall's that way. <laughs> True story. She's in here. I'm not talking about her behind her back. In 1 Corinthians 11, 23, let's read it together. I'm just going to read through it, and uh, I may repeat some of it. But, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in, re in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And I always say, and it's something you need to think about, remembrance is a covenant term, and you need to remember all these things. There are several things you need to remember in the Bible, but this is one of the most important, if not the. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are sick, and, uh, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep or have passed away. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. And when we are judged, we are not chastened by. Uh, when we are judged, we're chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Now, we're going to break this down just for a little bit. Now, I've heard hellfire and brimstone preach from that unworthiness, you know. I mean, my, I, back in the day when I wore Converse's, they were melting, you know, hell so hot. Is some, you know, you ever met some people that preach hell like they was born and raised there? Well, I, I want to preach heaven and the good news. But we're going to discern this and break some of these things out. And so, number one is let's discern the Lord's body or the body of Christ. Uh it said right there uh, in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four. 24, we read it. And when he had given thanks, he broke the bread and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, when Jesus left the disciples and they went to the garden to pray, that's when your deliverance began. In the garden, he began to take on the sins of the world. If you read it, the Bible says that he began to sweat great drops of blood. I, I, I've been under stress, but I've never been under that kind of stress. But people have been so stressed that they sweated blood before. The blood vessels in their face began to burst. You may have felt like you was that way, but no. Jesus began to sweat 
blood for us. Then he was, came, he was arrested, he was taken, uh, he was punched in the face, they pulled his beard out, they covered him up. Oh, they said, prophesy to us, who punched you? They took turns punching him. Then, then he, he, he was taken, he was whipped with a cat of nine tails. I mean, you know, we, we think about these whippings like Paul got. Every lash left a scar. It wasn't like you're getting a spanking. It's, it's with a, a rod that just cuts all the way through the skin into the muscle. And Jesus was whipped with a cat of nine tails for us. And, and a cat of nine tails is made with glass and metal and rocks. And when they whip you, it sticks. And then they yank it off and pull off flesh. Isaiah 53, he was wounded for our transgressions, our sins. He was bruised for our iniquities, the stuff that you even, Jesus said, if you think about sleeping with another woman, that's as if you did it. That's, that's sin. He was bruised for when you cross the line in sin. He even took it when you think about it. Iniquity. Chastise for our peace. You ever been called names? You know, used to be I'm called all kinds of names, but you know, now it's Bible thumper or whatever. I'll take that one. But we've been called names, picked on. You know, Isaiah, uh, in, in Ephesians, it talks about we've been chosen. We've been uh, ordained to be, walk with God, to be his children. But we have to choose him. And Jesus paid the price and shed his blood so that we could be a child of God. And not only be a child of God, but have everything that God has for us. And so when we discern the body, that's what we're talking about, that Jesus was whipped, then he, he carried his own cross as far as he could, and they nailed him to a cross. His body was given up for us. That's what you got to remember. You know, a lot of places take communion every Sunday. Nothing wrong with that. But I want to challenge you to take communion at home. It's a personal thing. It's not, it's not, that's what Paul's talking to them. They were getting together eating. Some of them were getting drunk. Some of them were just, it's just, ah, they weren't discerning the Lord's body. They just getting together to fellowship. It ought to be a real thing to where we're talking to Jesus and that we're honoring what he did. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done. I love you. I appreciate you. That's where we've got to let this, this sink in. In Romans 5, 8, it said, But God demonstrated his own love towards us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We need to remember that while we were sinners, and we need to not forget when we see somebody in, in sin, instead of telling them they're going to hell, that they need the grace and mercy that we receive. Let me tell you, there's a better way. I found a better way, and it's through Jesus. It's through his sacrifice. We got to recognize that that sacrifice was for us to be right with God. In Romans 14, 9, it says, For to this end Christ died and rose and, rose and lived again that he might be uh, Lord of both the dead and the living. Is he Lord? Now, so, if you ever never saw the passion it's hard to watch, but that's what you got to remember what Christ did. So put our picture up there. I got a picture that I want to show you. That's horrible. That is horrible. It's gross. It's terrible, but that's what he did for us. That's what we have to discern and to remember that not to just, ah, oh, it's just the Lord's Supper. Ah, oh, it's just communion. No, we're remembering what Jesus did. And the importance of it, that he died for us. He died for me. He died for you. And the importance of it. We need to stop and remember. I'm, I, 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 that is hard. You know, if you can take the picture down. For once and for all, Christ died. You don't have to be punished for your sin anymore. If you mess up, you ask God to forgive you, and he will. He's not going to punish you. See, we'll get to this here in just a little bit. This chastising thing is because you're not discerning the Lord's body. You have to 
uh, uh, appropriated. You know, I picked two, three Sundays on Clayton's taking everybody to ice cream. Well, you got to go to eat it. You got to go with him to get it. Only four people said, you know, you wasn't going to be out a whole lot of money. The rest of them didn't believe or didn't know you. If you don't know what Jesus has done for you, how can you receive what he's done for you? If you don't believe what he has done for you, how can you receive what he's done for you? You're with me? We need to be knowledgeable. We need to know. We need to remember and to open up. I know it's, it's hard to look at, but wait a minute. We don't have to walk through it. He bore it for us. Last Sunday, I said my favorite metaphor, sign, symbol in the Bible is when Moses stood before Pharaoh and that staff, he threw it and it became a, a snake. And we'll get into that here in a series, but a snake represents the devil. But he who knew no sin became sin that he might destroy sin. He destroyed the works of the devil. Jesus didn't become the devil. He took the sin nature. He took that sin. He was perfect, but he took it on purpose for us. And then they grab, you don't grab a snake by the tail. I know that. I'm not going to grab one, but you don't grab it by the tail because it'll turn around and pop you. Moses grabbed it by the tail, and it became a staff again. Jesus died and rose again. He took upon sin, your sin, my sin, and died for our sins. And Satan said, oh, he's a sinner, and took him to hell. But God judged him. He's righteous. And that gave Jesus the authority to drag him through, you messed up, boy. Give me the keys to the kingdom. And you're going to find some things out about that just a little while. You stick around. Number two, we need to remember the blood. What's the importance of the blood? You know, uh, in the Old Testament, they, they sacrificed animals. And they, they sprinkled it on the altar. They sprinkled it on the people. Man, thank God for Jesus and his sacrifice because I'd be throwing some blood on y'all today. That's gross, too. You know, I've skinned enough animals and, and stuff that, to know that how nasty it is. And, and to cut a covenant, Abraham, and, and, and they cut a covenant, they split the animals down the middle, and they walked through it barefooted. You don't forget that. You don't forget walking through that blood and those guts. You should not forget that Jesus shed his blood for you. That's why it says, remember, remember, remember. They did things in the Old Testament not to forget. Remember coming out of Egypt, they had the Passover stuff, and they did it every year to remember their deliverance out of Egypt. The Passover meal, the lamb, they shed the blood, they put it on the doorpost. The blood of Jesus is our protection. Hmm? The blood of Jesus backs every promise. I talk a lot about promises around here, but for you you have a right to every promise in the Bible because of the blood of Jesus, not because of you. It's because of him. Man, that makes it easy. Hey, he's buying the ice cream. All I got to do is partake of it. Jesus shed his blood. All I have to do is partake of it. I get his righteousness. I get to be right with God. Well, Pastor, you don't know. No, nah -huh. that's you thinking. Pastor, but I've messed up so bad. No, 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 Pastor, I backslid, and I don't think God ever died. Oh, that's you. That's you. You can't. Get out of you. Get into him. It's what he did, not what you did, or not what you can do. It's what Jesus did that makes us right with God. We have right relationship with God because of Jesus Christ. Man, it makes it so easy to, to love him. It makes it so easy to serve him. And so remember that his blood was shed for you. And there's power in the blood. We sang it for years, the hymns, and we forget. There's power in the blood. I sang that when I was a kid. I had no clue what that meant. But it was a cool song. Power, power, wonder working, power in the blood, in the blood of the Lamb. I used to, mm -hmm. Don't make me. Uh-huh. And then you'd go, pow, 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 wonder working, pow. You just had a bunch of powers to it. And everybody else was walking in weakness, though. 
There's power in the blood. But well, how do we get that power? How, how do we walk in power? We do, how do we, as she said, take authority? Right now, lay hands on yourself. That's how you take that power. Speak the word. Father, I thank you for power today on every person in this room that they'll learn to walk in it. Hmm? Okay. So in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five, 25, in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat and uh, eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So in Hebrews 9, it says, According to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission, no remission of sins. So, so for you to be cleansed, you need to ask Jesus to forgive you. And then you're washed in his blood. And he puts your sin as far as the east is from the west. Now, if we go around the earth and you go west and I go east, we're going to run into each other. But it's not talking about going around the earth. It's talking about going west right out through space and east right out through space. They never meet. Your sin ain't coming back. Your sin don't come back except it's right here. Oh, Lord, you remember what I did? I've asked you a hundred times. Just because it's come through your mind doesn't mean you haven't been forgiven. The devil's going to remind you of your past. Not Jesus. I let one preacher talking about the gifts of the Spirit. This preacher was preaching one time, and he goes, and the Lord spoke to him and said, do you know that woman's past? He goes, no, sir. And he goes, ma'am, the Lord asked me if I knew your past. And she began to cry. He go, I said, no, sir, I don't. And God said, I don't either. She's forgiven. But the devil will beat you over the head with your own past sin. Now, if you're in sin today, today's the day to repent. Today is the day of salvation. And salvation is every day. Every day you need to come clean with God. Doesn't that mean you, you know, just repent. You're not, here's the thing. As a believer, you're going to sin some time to time, but you're not a professional sinner. I can get in an 18-wheeler and I can get that thing to rolling, but you don't want to be in there with me. I am not a professional truck driver, and I am not a professional sinner. Huh? Some people are professional sinners. Isaiah, I used to quote it to the youth. Isaiah said, woe unto the children who plan a plan to add sin unto sin. You know, hey, man, we're going to have a party. You're going to get the stuff, and you're going to get the stuff, and you're getting the beer. We, we're professionals now. We're planning a plan, a plan, and a plan. Let's go to Vegas. Uh, sin city so so we're not professional sinners we're not walking every day trying to sin we're trying to be free we're trying to be clean and so we need to appropriate the blood of jesus that washes us and makes us clean god knows you're not perfect and he's not hating on you he's loving on you he's saying you get up come on up here come walk with me come walk with me use the blood Come on, and, and the, the, here's the biggest thing. Remember, what's the greatest commandment? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. What's the second greatest? To love your neighbor as yourself. And we start looking around at our neighbors. With one eye, here's where I want you to look first. Look at yourself. Love yourself like God loves you. Can we love ourselves because of the blood of Jesus like God loves us. Can we see ourselves with the eyes of Jesus? Come on. He loves us. He loves you so much he died for you. The Bible says for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. No, Put that picture back up there. Is there any joy in that picture? No. What in the world is the joy he's talking about? He looked out over eternity and saw you, giving your heart to him. He died for you. That was the joy. He endured it. Okay, you can take the picture down because they people getting grossed out. You got to remember. Listen, he took to that cross and stayed there. He could have called a, a legions of angels down to get him off of that cross. 
but he endured it for us. So the least we can do is give him our, all of our life, all of our heart, all of our mind to know him. And then number three is where I really want to hang out a little bit as we are the body of Christ in the earth today. That's part of discerning the body. Did you know that you, as a believer, that you're the body of Christ? That when he resurrected, you were resurrected? Already resurrected. What? The Bible says that we're seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Are you seated with him? Well, I don't feel like it. Doesn't, not, no, uh-uh, doesn't feel like it. He said you were. So change your perspective. Instead of looking up at your problem, you need to be looking down at your problem because you're seated with Jesus in the heavenlies. It's a change of perspective. Remember last Sunday I talked about a spirit of faith, an attitude of faith. Man, you ought to have an attitude of faith. Like, mm-mm, devil. No. No. Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. Now, he was talking to Peter, but Peter wasn't the devil. It was the words that came out of his mouth. The words that he heard were from Satan or an evil report. Even going to the cross wasn't an evil report for Jesus because he was doing it for us. So, in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, but let every man examine himself, so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner drinks judgment uh, to himself. The unworthy manner is that you're not remembering what Christ did. You're just going through the motions. Going through the, I don't want to go through the motions. I want to worship him on purpose. I want to love him on purpose. I want to walk with him on purpose. Do I always know, but I'm trying. You, well, you're the pastor. You better. Well, I got to. I feel that pressure. But every one of us, I have to walk by faith. I have to put Jesus in his rightful place because my flesh wants to be king. And I know you straighten your halo up. Y'all never think like that. But your flesh wants to be king. And that's why if the word of God is not true to you or not real to you, you will be king. But it will be to your destruction. Amen? We have to be king, not what we want to do. Not when I, it's what the Word says is what we want to do. And so let's discern the Lord's body. For this reason, many are, are weak and sick among you, and many are, have passed away or sleep. So, so, so let's go back to uh, Isaiah 53. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. That whipping was for our healing. And people want to argue that, uh, man, healing's in the atonement. There's over 100 healing scriptures. He sent his word to heal us. There's nothing wrong with medicine. I mean, he invented medicine to help us get our faith level up. Because most medicines just cover over the pain till you can get up on your feet. Come on, he's the bomb of Gilead. That's medicine. He's the healer of every, Psalms 103, he's the healer of every sickness and disease. And I, I, I heard a man preach that, and the pastor said, you really believe that? He goes, well, it says he heals all our diseases. He goes, yeah, but you really believe that? And what he was probably asking, not everybody gets healed. Not everybody does because they don't discern the Lord's body. I don't know why this is happening to me. It's the devil. Or you ate too many donuts. Or pizza. Look at him. He's dying, telling on me now. And so we got to discern. If the Lord said, don't eat that anymore, don't eat it anymore. But I like it because your flesh is wanting to be king. Your flesh is wanting to be Lord of your life. Does, hey, I like ice cream. It calls your name by 1130. I'm going to sleep. I'm hungry. There's chocolate ice cream in there. I bought it for the grandkids, but I'll eat it. They won't even know it. I can get some more tomorrow. I can buy all the ice cream I want. I'm old enough. <laughs> but you've got to learn to discern and, and, and take control of your flesh. Because your flesh is what watches porn. Your flesh is what binge on TV. How about binging the Bible? 
How about fasting TV and get into the Word? Just give me an hour, the Lord says. The Lord said, get, if you, if we'll, get back, we'll get into the Word here in a couple of weeks, but this year I've just been at the, how the word, the word of God is so real for us and real to us. And, and we need to, to learn to discern the Word. It's a spiritual book written from a spiritual God to spiritual people. You are a spirit. You are not a human having a spiritual experience. You're a spirit, man and woman, and you're having a fleshly experience. And you need to take dominion over your flesh. Let me just slap him right quick. That's, that's your flesh. That thought and that's flesh. That's not, Jesus never slapped anybody. And they got on his last nerve, but he controlled his flesh. And we have the power to do the same thing because of what Jesus did. Chastise for our peace. <sighs> you know, y'all ever met anybody just, uh, and I'm not pointing fingers at anybody, but, you know, some of you have anger problems. Man, when my brother, before my brother got saved, he'd kill you. He would literally try to kill you. You make him mad, he just went, he'd go bizarre. He'd chase us with butter knives and then find out we made fun of him. Then he got real knives. Then he got machetes. He worked at a sawmill, and he's pulling slabs. That's what they cut off to make cross ties. They weigh about 125 pounds. It's 120 degrees, and it's a hook. And a guy on the maintenance department came up behind him and gave him a wedgie. It's about 2 o'clock. It's 100 degrees. And he did this with his hook, and it cut that boy right there. I said, boy, you would have killed that man and been in prison for the rest of your life. He goes, yeah, but he ain't going to do that anymore. But then he gave his heart to Jesus, and he doesn't. He's like a. He's like a puppy now. Can't make him mad. I've tried. I'm his brother. What do you expect? So, we have to discern what Jesus has done. Before I read the next scripture, I want you to put my other picture up there. I was reminded of this, Lord, this week. The Lord said, show this picture. Look at that sheep. He's been hiding for six years. From the shepherd. He needs shearing. But he's used to carrying that extra 75 pounds. And every time the shepherd would come by, he'd run back in the cave and hide. But he needs shearing. And the Lord said, remind him and ask him, when's the last time they came to me to get, get rid of the extra weight they're carrying around? What, 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 what sin that are you carrying around? What, what is in your past that's bugging you that you can't move forward in God because you're not, you're not letting Jesus be the shepherd? You're not letting Jesus be Lord. I mean, you need shearing. We all need shearing. That's the chastising. Chastising's a good thing, y'all. You know? Hey, hey, I'm, let me chastise you. Don't touch the pan. It's hot. If you don't touch the pan, it's hot. You're just trying to keep me from doing what I want to do. And then, ah! Because, you know, I grew up, it was Jesus, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. Instead of Jesus said, you can do all things in Christ, in Christ. And that means he's going to guide me. Oh, I'm not going to do that. Oh, I'm not going to do that. I'm going this way right here. God's going to direct me and guide me into the blessing. Because, see, we get hung up in our flesh and we think that our flesh, oh, if we just feel good. Happiness is fleeting, folks. Alcohol is fleeting. Drugs are fleeting. It'll kill you. Sin is, is fun for a season, the Bible says, but the end of it is death. But, but this, this cat right here needs shearing, and we need to go and make Jesus Lord. There's people saved, but he's not Lord. That's a sheep. Still a sheep. If you're saved, you're a sheep. You're going to heaven. How about living for him and making him Lord so you'll have a blessed life? That you'll have the good things. He'll help you avoid the bad thing. Simple things to avoid that will keep us on track. Because everything the devil lays out, it comes to your mind and it's trying to trip you up and frustrate you, chastise you so you do not have peace, put you in sin, put you where you have to repent, you feel like you have to start over. Uh-uh. 
If I walk and trip and fall right here and I'm going to that wall, I get up. I don't have to start over. I keep walking. And I may trip and fall. But you know what? Lord, forgive me. Help me. And I'm still going to go. But most people, well, you ought to get back over here and get saved again. No, you don't. How many times will Peter have to get saved? Yeah, David made it. He's a murderer and an adulterer. Sin is sin, and we need to avoid it. It destroys us. It's terrible. It's horrible. God hates sin. Why does God hate sin so much? Because it hurts his people. And God can't have anything to do with sin. He hates sin like a car wreck. Come on, car wrecks will hurt you. So, don't be the sheep that stays away from the shepherd. Listen to what this says in Ephesians. We're discerning that we're the body of Christ. Are you a child of God? Then you're the body of Christ. Listen to what it says in Ephesians. Chapter 1, verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? Well, are you, we, are you believe? Say, I believe. So what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe? According to the working of his mighty power. This is what his power has done for us. Look at the next verse, verse 20. Which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places. If God's on the throne right here, Jesus is at his right hand. And that's where we're at. And Jesus got, can't Jesus do anything, y'all? Can he not do anything? Come on, every wino in Louisiana knows Jesus can do anything. Because I have talked to them. Not every one of them, but most of them. You try to witness to them. Oh, the Lord can do anything. How about set you free? Look at the next verse. Far above principality and power, might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but the age to come. Every devil, every demon, every sin, every sickness, Jesus is seated far above it all. Let him pull you up today. And that which is to come, every name. Now, verse 22, and has put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. All right, did, did y'all, y'all, y'all sitting there like, what? Huh? Is it over? Come on, wake up with me now. Look at this. And he put all things under his feet, everything's under Jesus' feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, to believers. Want a new governor? Pray. Want a new president? Pray. Bind powers and principalities. You want our city to change? You want your husband to change? Quit nagging at him. Pray. Don't elbow him, wife. I do that. Huh? You want your kids to change? You've got the power to believe God, to send the angels after him, the Holy Spirit after him, and to do all things. And so he gave all power to the church. Verse 23, which is his body. The fullness of him that fills all in all. We're the body of Christ. You hear people say it. We're the body of Christ. That means we're his hands, his feet. We're doing the walking. We're doing the talking for him. We're doing the loving. We're doing the praying. We're his body in the earth. We're his representative. Well, if the Lord don't undertake, he's already undertook. He put Jesus on the cross, and he gave you authority to go witness. Romans 10 said, how will they know unless somebody goes? How, how will they go? How will they know unless somebody tells them that he, that he died for them? You got to be telling somebody, oh, now you're pushing us, Pastor. Uh, get yourself assured. Get your assurance. Get yourself that you, assured that you know that you're a child of God and that you're right with God. And now, you, you and then boldness is going to come. I, you need to know till, you go, till you're bold. Well, I, I see people with false humility. Well, Pastor, I, I really don't know. Uh, I, you know, the Lord don't want to do things. Quit that. Be bold. Be bold in Him. Be bold. He's calling you to a higher mark. Listen to Romans 8.32. 
He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? He wants to give us all things. Uh, there's so much goofiness out there about uh, God's, God's our provider. How about provision? Uh, how about um, prosperity? Oh, we're talking prosperity. Man, Abraham was prosperous. Isaac was prosperous. And Jacob was prosperous. Really what prosperous means, y'all, let me help you out right here. Oh, excuse me, I'm going to borrow your stuff right here. Um, let me you know, see how much money she got. Yeah. Hold on, hold on. Prosperity means to take a burden and carry it. Don't get turned off when somebody says God wants to prosper you. He wants to take your burden and carry it. He wants to put it on his back. That's what he did at Calvary. And what if you got bills? He wants to take that burden and help you get a better job. He, if you're sick in your body, he wants to take that. But he's already took that burden, and he wants you to have healing. He's carried that burden. You just got to get in the mindset that God wants to help me and partner with me in my job, with my wife, with my family. He wants to partner with me in everything. He wants to carry your burden. He wants to set you free. It's all in the gospel. That's the good news. To give sight to the blind. So I'm going to finish with this one last scripture, and they don't have it back there. Uh, I, I follow a... Uh, a uh, Greek scholar, his name's Rick Renner, and he's a pastor in Russia. And he's writing uh, his own interpretive uh, New Testament. He's, he's a Greek scholar, and so uh, in James 1.17, it says, every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. If you, Maybe you've heard that. But a lot of people will preach that God will put stuff on you, that God will, you know, do this and do that. But I want to remind you, John 10 that, that Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And Jesus said, I've come to give life and that more abundantly. Okay? And so I want you to listen to what? He took the Greek and broke this scripture down. And it's a little long, but we're going to read it right quick. And it says, you need to know that everything given by God is always good, beneficial, and profitable. Make no mistake. This is what God always habitually and perpetually gives. Even more, everything bestowed on us by him will never subtract from our lives. But whatever he gives adds to our lives. So let me help you with that. God can give you a job and it may go south. It may go to hell in the handbasket. And it's not because of him. It's because the people you're working with or you've done something. We have an enemy, y'all. And if you start getting blessed, he's like, well, I need to do something about that. He's wanting to stop you. Don't let him stop you. Somebody said, somebody said, I'm mad at God. I'm mad at God. And I'm thinking, when's the last time you read your Bible? When's the last time you prayed? When's the last time you went to the shepherd? You're that sheep that needs shearing. And you're mad at God, and you're carrying all this extra weight around that you're not supposed to be carrying, and you, you are the one, not him. We want to blame God for the stuff that we do, or we haven't it drawn close. And so let's, let's finish. And it, it advan what God gives, it advances us, completes us, matures us, and perfects us. This is what comes from heaven, and it comes pouring down from the Father, whose specialty is imparting life, and who is known of uh, known of light that dispels the hint of darkness. If you draw near to his side, you'll find that with him there is absolutely no inconsistency on the question of what he gives and what he never gives. You see, he's not like the shadow on the sundial that's constantly changing because the sun's position is always moving around. Instead, on the question of what he gives and what he never gives, God's position is absolutely fixed. He never budges. So let me address one more thing before we take communion. Some of you have 
I, I, I hear people tell me, well, I'm Job. I'm just going through this and that. Job wasn't there six months. You've been there 10 years. It's time to get out of that hole. Time to quit wallowing in that. I, I, I just feel like, Pastor, everything, everything's uh, coming, coming down on me. Uh, I, I'm just tempted on every side. Jesus was tempted 40 days and the devil left him. Come on, it's 10 years, five years. Y'all, it's been a year. It's time to move forward. It's time to lay that aside and let's break free today and let God set us free. And if you got sickness in your body, let's apply it. This body was broken and this blood was shed for you to have these things. Say amen. I know I'm forcing you to say amen because maybe you haven't heard this before, but this is what he paid. The good news. Listen, heaven's great, but God wants you to have heaven on earth. How do we get there? It's called change. Change up here. Change and start pressing in towards God. You change your life for the better. So let's take the cup. Y'all take it and let's get the bread out. So Paul wrote that he took the bread and that he prayed over it. And we're going to remember in this prayer, I'm about to pray. We're going to remember what Jesus has done for us. Is everybody ready? So let's pray. Father, we thank you for the bread that represents the body of Jesus Christ that was broken for us. Father, I thank you. As we have seen that Jesus was beaten, that he was whipped, uh, that, that he sweated blood, that he was nailed to a cross, that his body uh, was beaten for us. And Father, we appropriate the forgiveness and the life that, that is in Christ Jesus, that he came to set us free. And Father, I speak healing in this place. I speak peace to the minds of everyone here for Jesus bore that crown of thorns that we could have the peace, uh, the curse that's in our mind, the peace to come. And Father, I thank you. We remember and we receive in Jesus' name. Say, I receive and take partake of the bud. I receive. Just close your eyes a minute. Just worship the Lord. Thank Him for His body that was broken for you. Lord, we thank You. Lord, we remember. We receive. Now take the cup and let's open it up. So in the same manner, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do in remembrance as often as you drink it. So this represents the blood of Jesus. Father, we thank you for the blood that washes us and makes us white as snow. We thank you for your sacrifice and for the shedding of blood that has cleansed us. We thank you that your blood is still on the mercy seat today and, and there's forgiveness there for every person on the earth, those who are alive and everyone who's ever lived. We thank you, Father, that there's power in that blood. And Father, we uh, set ourselves to receive that forgiveness in life, to receive the power that's in the blood of Jesus. We thank you that we're washed in it but, Father, we thank you for the protection of the blood. We thank you, Father, that it's on the doorpost of our hearts and that we're free in Jesus' name. So let's take the cup and let's partake. Just stand to our feet just for, for, for just a moment and let's sing over the blood. The blood of Jesus, oh, the blood of Jesus, oh, the blood of Jesus, it washes. Oh, the blood. 
close your eyes and let's worship him just for a moment. time let's sing healing there's healing close your eyes. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for every person in this room. Lord, those that are close, those that are, aren't. Father, I thank you. You draw us all to the next level, Lord, in you. Father, to walk closer with you. Thank you, Father, for the victory today. Thank you that we're free. Lord, we're, we ask you to go ahead and shear us like that sheep we saw. Father, that we can be your person, to be the people of God, to walk in uh, with you, to build the kingdom of God in the earth, in our children, and ourselves and in our community, in our state, and around the world. And we give you the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen.